Well, uh, thanks again, Jen, for having me. And I'm really excited to you know, actually be talking about the locust berry again, because it's uh, uh, working with orchids now in the, in the Million Orchid Project and native orchids. Um, this is one of the other key components um, that we have to consider uh, when we think about bringing back uh, rare native orchids and what are the other um, uh, species and interactions that they have with other organisms like host trees and pollinators and other plants. And uh, we'll talk a lot about this kind of awesome ecology of the locust berry and uh, their association with oil collecting bees here in South Florida, as well as how that influences and impacts uh, orchid populations. Um, and the awesome title uh, is, I got to credit Jen for that because <laughs> I just uh, used what she had used. So it's a great one. But without further ado, um, before we can really understand, oh, hold on, can't advance. All right, is everyone on slide two? Quickly, Jen, sorry. Yes. Okay, thank you, it's working. Um, before we can really think about uh, and talk about this interaction that happens in this little tiny pocket of extreme Southern Florida, we have to know more about uh, Bursonema and uh, the locust berry itself. And this species is a member of a larger family called the Malpighiaceae, and otherwise known as the Barbados cherry family, um, you know, heard referred to as. And um, it's, it's really not a very well understood family and particularly even some of the uh, genera that are within it. Um, it's estimated that there's around 70 to around 80 genera um, uh, that they're, they're considering right now as recognized and over a thousand species. But really what makes them unique is that these are um, key components of neotropical dry forest types. So these are dry forests. So uh, pine rocklands, hammocks and dry neotropical savannas. So these are environments that are very different than um, um, a moist or a mesic hammock in that you know, there's very little canopy in these areas. Um, so it's, it's almost like scorched earth. Of course, they're seasonally dry in a lot of these uh, regions like the Caribbean, so they have a pronounced dry season. Also, a lot of these are pyrogenic communities, so they burn periodically throughout the year. So, um, although they're nestled, um, you know, in the uh, outskirts of the subtropics and tropics, uh, they're a very different forest type. And uh, the, this group of Malpighiaceae tends to specialize in this rough environment. Um, you can find Malpighiaceae as vines, uh, shrubs, and even trees and small trees. And some of the common uh, other other common species you might encounter here in South Florida include things like uh, the Barbados cherry, um, which per, um, uh, you, you'll be able to see that at the garden. Um, it's it's commonly used in landscapes and um, uh, fruiting tree gardens and groves. Uh, it produces the edible uh, berry, the Barbados cherry, as thus the family is named after, um, which is a really rich source of vitamin C and also quite tasty. Um, we also have things like bunchosia you might be familiar with. These are small trees. Uh, which you can also encounter in the landscapes here in South Florida. Uh, Marmello is another uh, name I've heard it re referred to as. Um, but again, these uh, tend to be small trees. And also things that are vines or lianas like our Banisteriops, like Banisteriopsis um, or ayahuasca, which has become more popular, also called the soul vine. And some may recognize that um, this, this plant actually has an important role in Native American medicine and um, religious ceremonies. Um, and it's become quite popular for Westerners and, and people from the U.S. to go down and um, uh, have uh, these ritualistic uh, religious experiences in South America. But that's also within this Malpighiaceae family. But uh, one characteristic that the Malpigs have, and I'll, I may refer to them as Malpigs just for short, um, are oil glands. And that makes their flowers quite different and entices and elicits um, interactions with uh, bizarre groups of uh, these bees in particular, and they have co-evolved these relationships. So the flowers themselves have evolved to attract the pollinator. And so as you'll see, these are very, very close interactions um, and uh, they're tightly evolved. So here's a, a beautiful example of a Malpighiaceae. It's not native to South Florida, it's native to South America, parts of Ecuador, um, and um, it may get up into parts of uh, Colombia and Venezuela. Um, this is Stigma phylum puberum. But again, what, you're, what, what this picture shows is the flower architecture and structure. Um, so this group um, of malpigs is really defined by these intensely clawed petals. So typically they're five clawed petaled flowers. And if you actually, let's see if I 
So can you see, if you can see my pointer, you'll actually um, see the oil glands in between the bases of the petals. Um, so there's two kind of globular looking calyx, and these are actually oil producing glands. And it's not um, really, a, it's a lipid based compound, but it's not quite like an oil, it's more would be accurately described as kind of a resin. And this is the reward that the pollinators are after in this group of plants. Um, and you can also see, you know, things like the anthers, um, but, but this architecture, these very highly clawed petals, very often brightly colored um, with these very, per, you know, pronounced, um, highly visible, shiny oil glands is, is some of the visual cues that the bees are, um, are being elicited by. Oh boy, that did not come out well. Um, but I'll have a better photo next. But again, um, a, the idea with this old diagram by Stefan Vogel, who actually started working with this um, pollination syndrome in this group of plants in the early 1900s, uh, shows how the bee actually um, fits the flower and um, collects the oil, which I think I'll have a better photo here, which I did. So um, uh, a lot of this kind of mysterious group of these insects and, the, and these plants um, have garnered a lot more attention you know, in the late 90s and in the 2000s, um, because they're um, in a lot of these habitats that are imperiled like the pine rocklands. And so a little bit more about this oil bee, oil plant, orchid pollination syndrome, if you will. And a lot of times the pollinators will use the word syndrome um, because again, these behaviors are evolved. Um, they're, they're driven by, their, by genetics, not by necessarily um, um, you know, individual differences. Um, so they're really a truly a syndrome um, to where the bees are compelled to behave in these ways due to evolution and their um, interactions with the environment. So these, um, as, as you can imagine, these are highly specialized and often obligate relationships. So in other words, the plant has to have the pollinator and the pollinator has to have the plant. So these, these oil, oil plant, orchid, um, oil, oil bee syndromes are true mutualisms in the sense of the word and symbiosis. They actually have to have and depend on each other to thrive. So when we think about conservation and connect to protect, that's why plants like the locust berries you'll see are so critical to completing that, that ecosystem um, function. Um, and they're, they're required. Every piece is required for the ecosystem to function properly. Um, so these do not involve the generous pollinators, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, so things like honeybees and bumblebees um, that just forge um, across a variety of, of plants um, really don't provide the, the, um, the uh, they don't really provide the services to the flower um, as these specialist pollinators do. So most important bee genus of specialist pollinator oil bees here in South Florida are the centrus, the genus centrus. And um, they're, they associate with our native locust berry, but uh, also non-native Mount Pigiaceas, which are planted in the landscape. Uh, we'll talk also bring up a few examples of that as well we've we've um, encountered um, but they also interact and are really critical to the pollination of orchids uh, which um, uh, some prominent genera include certipodium our native cowhorn orchid um, oncidium our native oncidiums as well as our mule orchid trichocentrum and looks like a typo um, spell check and they're really good at scientific names but that's trichocentrum or the mule ear orchid um, and this class of orchids these 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 genera um, rely on um, cheating, essentially, the oil bees into pollinating them. So they do all types of, uh, of tricks, uh, both in terms of their appearance, in terms of um, their fragrance at times, to trick these oil bees, which are going after a certain um, flower, a certain um, reward, and tricking them into pollinating the orchid and become part of this kind of really bizarre and complex web of life. So a little bit more about generalists when I say the term generalist versus specialist pollinators. So generalist pollinators are the bees that don't much care. We tell the little ones. Um, so these are bees, uh, most, uh, most importantly, the honeybee, which is by far our most important bee in terms of its commercial and agricultural importance, right? So the European honeybee, as well as the, you know, the African uh, um, species um, are or subspecies um, are really critical in pollinating many of our food crops and driving the economy and you know human health and well-being, as well as bumblebees, which are also generalists, um, and they are very are largely responsible for both agricultural crops but a lot of our native crops. So a lot of folks don't uh, don't realize that 
the honeybee is actually non-native, is not native to the United States, uh, to North America. It was brought in um, to help facilitate crop pollination. And um, it, it's also found in, in the natural areas where it also, um, as a generalist, interacts and provides pollination services for also a variety of native and non-native plants. Um, again, because of this generalist nature. They don't much care. They're just after pollen. They're just after nectar. And they're being reinforced by those, by those food rewards. While specialist bees um, are different. So they're, they're actually solitary. They don't produce uh, the hive as you'll find in the uh, generalist bees. Um, and they don't form the caste systems uh, where you know, the, the queen stays at the hive and doesn't forage in, in most uh, instances. Um, and the worker bees are out doing all the work and um, collecting the, uh, the food to bring back to the hive. Well, specialist bees are different. Um, they, they will dwell uh, solitarily. Um, often they'll be in cavities like holes in limestone or in um, bored out. They can bore out the ends of stems and in hollow stems and parts of uh, trees and in canopies. But uh, they, the females will collect just like they do the work, just like the males, unlike the honeybees and the general bees, and uh, they will uh, lay their eggs and care for their brood solitarily on their own. So um, because they require these very special rewards, um, they form very narrow relationships. And another example of a, a specialist bee is this uh, green bee here on the lower left, um, which is a euglossin or orchid bee. Um, this is another bee that is in, um, actually um, appeared on our landscape here in South Florida over the last uh, couple decades and now is naturalized and um, um, we're trying to learn more about its impacts uh, as we speak. And it's native to uh, South and Central America, the orchid bee. Um, the most important uh, specialist oil collecting bee here for us in South Florida um, is going, and the Caribbean in general, are the genus um, Centris, which I talked about earlier. Um, it's a um, quite diverse um, genus containing nearly 144 species, almost predominantly neotropical in their distribution. Uh, really focused, the, 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 the center of diversity is in the Caribbean um, islands, uh, Bahamas, Cuba, parts of Jamaica, all the way into um, uh, Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula, where you find most of these dry forest types where the Malpighiaceae and the centrist bees can be found. You can actually see a couple photos of uh, different centrist bee species. And one thing they all have in common is they're fuzzy bees. They're like little kind of teddy bears. Um, they're an, a medium sized bee, so they're a bit larger than a uh, honeybee, but they're going to be smaller um, than a bumblebee. So they're kind of in between a honeybee and a bumblebee, but they're, they're quite stocky like a bumblebee and they're not as slender as you'll find the, uh, in like a honeybee or a sweat bee. So they're, they're quite charismatic little critters too. I mean, they're, they're very docile. Uh, they'll, if you're still and just observing, they don't mind buzzing around and doing their little business, uh, paying no attention to the observer. So they're actually quite uh, great, uh, really kind of nice bees and easy bees to work with in, in research. And you'll see a little bit about kind of some of the work we've done with these guys. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, including all of these oil collecting bees, the females really play the prominent role in that they're the ones that collect um, and synthesize and modify these oils to uh, basically create provisions for their little larva um, in their nests, as well as actually creating the seal and uh, the cavity and uh, the wax coating of their little brood cavities. Um, so um, for the food, they'll actually mix their little resin or wax with the uh, pollen and create a food provision. And then they'll keep just the resin or the wax to, to kind of align their cavity and seal it off uh, during, in the case of our native bee, during the, uh, during the uh, winter months. So Bursonema lucida. So you got a little background and now we'll dive into our system here um, in South Florida. And so uh, the locust barrier um, scientifically referred to as Bursonema lucida is the sole member of really of the Malpighiaceae family in the state of Florida. It's one of only two species in the entire North America. It's really represents this kind of outlier of this neotropical Caribbean distribution. Again, one of these, these organisms that make it just to the southern tip of Florida and really nowhere else in the United States. Um, in South Florida, you'll find commonly find them associated with pine rockland habitat. Uh, that doesn't mean they can't be found in hammocks um, and things like that, but they're, they tend to be pine rockland specialists, and I'm willing to go that far, um, that really uh, the, the largest populations that remain, and they're just as rare, it seems, as the, as the uh, pine rocklands themselves, um, 
are, are in these um, remnant pine rocklands throughout Miami-Dade County and the Keys. Um, they'll flower from March to May, uh, and it's a kind of a tight window, um, and they produce kind of a, a flower that will change over time. So the flowers will open, the fresh flower will be bright, white, and clean. Um, day two, it will fade to pink, and then on day three, it's red. So it's really a, a spectacular plant and quite dynamic in terms of its color and it's always changing, it's beautiful. Um, this, uh, it's also important to mention that this is still uh, listed as threatened under the, uh, um, in the state of Florida. So it, it, it garners more attention and conservation action. So here's the distribution of this uh, species in Florida. And you can see it is restricted to Miami-Dade and Monroe counties. Um, this species is not known to historically occur even in Collier or Lee County or Broward for that, for that matter. So again, just another um, an example of how specialized this species is and, and really isolated to these pine rocklands, which are restricted on the southeastern portion, the extreme southeastern portion of our state getting into the Keys. Uh, Here's a, here's a map with a little bit more resolution of kind of off the IRC website. And again, you can see almost 100% of these um, little waypoints correspond with a pine rockland fragment of some type. And what's really cool about this map, again, aside from its large, it's absent from the greater amount of the Everglades and uh, Broward County, um, but also is that it's, it's absent largely from the middle of Keys. And, um, you know, maybe another you know, uh, speaker will talk a little bit more about that, but I, that always puzzled me. Um, I know they have more hammock and less of these uh, rocky outcroppings and pinelands, but um, you know, some of those, some of these hammocks were, are similar to the ones I'll find it in Miami Dade, but it's largely absent from the Middle Keys, which is interesting. So there's a couple of photos of the plant itself. Um, you saw the flowers, but again, they'll produce uh, uh, small flowers. We're talking about a couple centimeters in uh, length. Uh, they're simple, entire. And uh, what's really nice about them, I think, is that the new flush is usually this very vibrant, light green, and it contrasts really beautifully with the uh, older uh, leaves, which are usually a darker green. Um, and also, I've known this uh, plant to be deciduous in certain times of the year um, um, here in uh, southern Florida. So it will tend to drop its leaves uh, around the winter months and then flush out again in spring. So there are a, a couple other growth habit differences between this plant. Um, one of which is in um, its size. So in Miami-Dade County, for the most part, these plants occur as small shrubs and they're really restricted to these pine rockland fragments and gardens for the most part. And um, a little bit uh, of research into this plant realized that, and also actually breeding it uh, for conservation here in South Florida, uh, they realized that this actually uh, both genetic influences and ecological influences causing this. So, um, they, they were basically the genetic influences refer to the fact that seeds of plants grown in Miami-Dade tend to say shrub size in their, in their growth habit. And the seeds collected from plants in the keys tend to be much larger and to the small tree size and actually look quite different you know, you know, from, from the amateur look. Um, that's also uh, kind of exacerbated here in Miami-Dade County in that uh, many of these plants occur in pine rocklands, which are, are burnt um, still uh, through prescribed burns. So every three or four years, they're really knocked back and it really prevents them from putting on any um, you know, large woody masks. Um, so they stay very dwarfed in size. So plants, you know, that you're going to find in Miami-Dade are going to be right around that two to three um, in the Pine Rocklands, that is. In gardens, they're going to get bigger and fuller. But they're going to be right around that two to three foot in height and, uh, you know, your typical shrub. And you can just see the amount of buds on that plant. So they're quite spectacular, even in small sizes. Um, sorry for this photo. It's almost impossible to take a good photo of these bursanema. Uh, but um, this is an example of what the bursanema will look like in Monroe. Pay attention to the trunks. Um, again, these now become small trees, both uh, through those genetic, uh, that genotype difference with the Miami-Dade County, and probably likely they also do less fire. They can put on a lot more size, doesn't burn nearly as much down there in the Keys. Um, and again, here's a, a photo of one of our larger specimens at Fairchild, which was actually the provenance is the Keys. And you can see this one is, is reaching a, a upwards of 15 feet in height. So it's, it's, it's well on its way to being a, a beautiful um, tree. They can get up to about uh, records about 30 feet in height, uh, some of the largest ones. But I know um, in the Keys, you can actually see some of these uh, grand specimens. But they're like many of these um, really hard woody uh, species down here, they're very slow growing. Um, so 
Um, I, I can imagine that some of these larger ones in the Keys have to be like some of these lignum vitaes and upwards of 100 plus years old. So here are the flowers in a little bit more detail of the bursinema. It's your classic Malpighiaceae flower, as you can see here. You can actually see the different color uh, forms of this flower on this uh, photo. And again, those arrows showing where those uh, oil glands are glistening, um, trying to entice those little bees into come and collecting those oils. And they'll produce an edible fruit. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on this. I think some more other locust berry folks are gonna talk about this, but these are actually uh, edible fruit um, and they're really important food sources for both birds, but also uh, a number of species of native tortoise. And uh, this is some really, um, and, and both of these organisms act as dispersers for this plant, seed dispersers. So as they eat up these little berries and run off, they poop them out and uh, you get new bursinema dis uh, dispersed throughout the environment. Uh, so this is just a little glimpse of the little fruits on this guy. You can see the little remnant oil glands uh, where the sepals would be. Um, so here's our native oil bee, um, and this is a zoomed out, I zoomed in view just so you can kind of get a better look at it. It's very hard to capture photos of bees in real time, um, but this you can see is a, a little fuzzy little teddy bear looking thing, and they're, they're kind of a light brown in color. They're very fuzzy. They have these massive hind legs that are also really hairy and brown, and they have really distinct deep uh, kind of um, uh, amplitude buzz. So they almost have like a really distinct sound after you've been observing them for enough times, which is pretty scary because I can actually hear them <laughs> just without even seeing them occasionally. Um, and this uh, likely would be a female that's out foraging on bursinema. Um, and you can see the classic behavior captured here where this little female is gripped onto that uh, bud in this case, and she'll use those uh, legs, her front legs, to scrape of uh, the glands. And as she's using those glands, the hairs are actually uh, rupturing the glands um, and collecting and uh, secreting that oil. And she will collect that oil and transfer that oil from her front legs to her middle legs, all the way to her hind legs, each flower. Um, while they're actually collecting the oil, of course, the, the role for the plant is to pollinate the plant and the yellow anthers are loaded with pollen. And that pollen um, basically is, um, is adhered directly to their, to their underside, the ventral side of their bellies, essentially their chest and belly. And it's passed on to the next plant as they forage for more and more oil. Um, so um, they're really effective pollinators. Another cool thing about these bees is they actually um, buzz pollinate. So in addition to um, just kind of getting the free pollen, they actually create a low frequency buzz which stimulates the stamens to shake more pollen loose. And uh, again, the general bees do not do this. And another reason why um, general bees will not be sufficient pollinators for these specialized plants. They're not able to do the buzz pollination or our bumblebees. Here's just uh, another, sorry for the resolution, but I want to show you here is that, that rear leg, that hind leg loaded with pollen and waxy mixture that will then go back to the nest. So, this pollinator, as I mentioned, also is really important to orchids. Uh, these are the two species of orchid, which are the cheaters of our nasive native Bursinema. So a lot of the orchids in the Oncidinae or Oncidium genus cheat Malpighiaceae plants. So almost everywhere you go in, in the Neotropics uh, where you'll find an Oncidium, you will find a co-occurring close proximity Malpighiaceae that's usually yellow or some similar color. And likewise, in extreme southern Florida, where we have our cow horn and our native city, and we have the bursinema in close proximity historically to these plants, where these orchids were cheating or trying to trick the, um, the pollinator into thinking it was going to provide an oil. And how it does that is one through color. Uh, this cryptic and mottled red and yellow color is provides a UV um, reflection that the bees recognize, the specialist bees. Also, you'll notice these pertubicles or these little protuberances or calyxes that are kind of near uh, the lip of the orchid and up in the lip of the orchid. And you'll see it on the, the certipodium as well. These are to mimic oil glands. So the, the bees really think these are oil glands and they go right after that orchid um, and get tricked. Unfortunately, they don't get oil. Um, yeah, we don't think that they provide any oil. There's no evidence they do. So they're completely being duped at the cost of the pollinator. So here's a couple of examples of our native cow horns. Uh, this is an example of, a, of one of our cow horns at Fairchild. This is a dated photo. This plant now probably about three times its size, um, but you can see uh, um, the flowers on that beautiful orchid and the cow horn-like pseudobulbs. 
And there, there's baby orchids of this species all throughout the garden. So um, just really quickly, uh, in about the, well, I'd say about 25 years ago, there was um, an observation of a new citrus bee that kind of interloped on the scene. And uh, this was a new species, not native to Florida, called Centrus nitida. And you can see it looks very different than our native oil bee. It's actually yellow thorax and has a jet black abdomen and jet black hind legs. But there are, it's, it's actually closely related. It's actually a little bit smaller than um, Centrus erins. But this one appeared on the scene and I actually started, uh, we took notice of it, uh, my, my colleagues, and I began to study um, uh, this bee and how it interacted with our native uh, Malpighiaceae. How did it know to be attracted to a plant it's not did not co-evolve with. So how tight is this co-evolution co really um, was some of the questions we were trying to understand by looking at these closely related pollinators from one from that's native and one that's non-native. So Centrus nitida is native to kind of uh, tropical regions of Central America uh, and Mexico. It likely came in through plant um, the plant trade. Um, again, they're cavity nesters. They nest in board out limbs of trees and twigs. So likely the plants kind of were, were maybe moved through the plant trade. One could think, could speculate. Um, and it has been, it, it's now considered naturalized here in southeastern Florida. Um, this thing is known to get after a, a number of our native ornamental plants, including invasive plants and our rare plants like our bursanema and certipodium which is actually providing pollinator services for as well. Um, another interesting thing and a difference between uh, the, the non-native and native or uh, citrus bees, pardon me, is that the citrus nitida, our non-native, flies year round. Whereas our native orchid bee, the flight time only coincides with the flowering of the locust berry. So the other nine months of the year, citrus errands, females and males are dormant um, underground uh, growing as larva. So um, that also begged another question. It's like, well, what the heck is Centrus Nitida doing for the rest of the year uh, when it can't get its oil to reproduce, um, but every three months? And we found out it's actually tapping into other uh, Malpighiaceae as well. So again, what's known is we know that these, these new bees um, have a really patchy distribution. You'll find them in gardens, urban areas, parks in Miami-Dade, as well as Broward. Um, but I haven't really seen it too much out of that those two counties. I haven't yet observed it in the Keys or Everglades National Park after uh, the years of watches, but that may have changed. So if someone's seen it around, it's very distinctive yellow and black. Uh, that'd be great to know where and when. Um, so uh, just really quickly, uh, a little bit of the research we did looking at these bees in this kind of complex situation, this this uh, really cool interaction. Uh, we were we were looking at a lot of uh, garden sites that we knew Bursanema was present, um, as well as a number of Pine Rocklands in, in Miami-Dade County and the Keys as well. And uh, looking where uh, sites where, you know, we had the locust berry and where the native bee was present or the invasive bee or maybe both. And what was going on? How were the plants affected by two pollinators, specialist pollinators now? And so this involved thousands of hours of uh, watching Bursanema, uh, recording every single visit by a pollinator of any type, and a whole uh, mess of students over the years helped me with this, this research in all of these uh, field sites. And we would bag flowers each year and count fruit sets. And uh, uh, we found some interesting things. And really what we found is that as expected, uh, the native oil bee was kind of the dominant um, pollinator of, of the locust berry. About 21% of our time out there so um, uh, the majority of the, the bees we found were native oil bees. Uh, but again, we only really recorded bees about 21% of the time and, and it was the native oil bee. Um, we did also about 2% of our watch time, we did record the presence of the uh, non-native or invasive oil bee. Um, and about 2% of the time they were kind of active on the plant at the same time. So this is very clear evidence that the native oil bee still remains the most important pollinator of our native locust berry. Um, here in South Florida and the Keys as well. Um, so this also is, is seen very quickly here in our visitation rates. So again, the native oil bee was the dominant visitor in terms of, in terms of how many flowers and plants um, they were visiting um, compared to the invasive oil bee. Um, but what was interesting and we weren't expecting is that the invasive or the non-native citrus knitted up actually was a more efficient pollinator. Um, which begs the question of these evolutionary and how quick is evolution happening uh, with these plants and pollinators. Um, so we weren't expecting this, to find out that it was more efficient. In other words, when it visited a flower, uh, 
it was more likely for that flower to set fruit than the native. So it did a better job at pollinating. So as a result, the evidence shows that, you know, even though this is non-native, it's actually the, the birds and were actually benefiting from just having additional pollinators um, in the area that were capable of pollinating the special flower type. Um, so it's one of these rare examples of an introduced species uh, really um, benefiting a rare native species. You don't see that too often in ecology. Um, okay, this is not really to, to look over, but I put this in, if you look in the center of this figure, uh, it's a little bit skewed, but um, um, what we've done essentially is over the last couple of years, we've worked upon this kind of uh, looking at this um, pollination web with looking, including our non-native Malpighiaceae and seeing if the non-native oil bee preferred the, the Malpighiaceae from its region versus the ones from South Florida, the Versanema. And indeed, we found another pattern that um, when it had its choice between Versanema and um, Stigma phylon, the yellow flower there, um, it, prefer, um, it preferred to go to its, the one it recognized or it likely co-evolved with. So again, it's just playing out all in real time. So in conclusion, uh, it's really important that we promote this plant. That's why I was thrilled to just give a little talk on the pollinators. Um, so we want to really increase the planting of locust berry throughout Miami-Dade County and the Keys. Um, this is not only going to help all these specialized pollinators, the dusky wings, um, of course, um, but also these rare native orchid populations um, that we're planting as part of the Million Orchid Project. And without that um, host, that the reward plant, um, the orchids really have a very little chance. Some of these orchids like Certipodium and Oncidiums have very small chance of being able to produce fruit set in the wild. So, or in, in our outplanting areas. So it's really important we promote these. Um, another cool thing is that it also may be a potential pollinator for our native Trichocentrum, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and just a couple things uh, when you're thinking about um, planting these plants in your, your garden landscapes as they become more available, uh, make sure you think also about those seed sources that I mentioned. Um, the genotypes are very different. If you get seed source from a, a Miami Dade, can, it's going to be a shrub in your landscape. But if you get one from the Keys, it's going to be a small tree. So those are big uh, decisions that you have to make when thinking about planting in your landscapes at home. Um, but with that said, thank you for, and I'll, I'll take any questions at this time and I can uh, drop off the share.